Welcome back to Ask Garden Said. I am so excited because we have a special guest today. Very special guest, near and dear to my heart, is Luai um, from you. Urban Veggie Garden. That's right. On Instagram. So today we are going to answer as many questions as we can get through about tomatoes mm -hmm. with a hint of Japanese beetle talk Ooh. because they are bad this year and uh, the garden said groups are talking a lot about Japanese beetles so we want to help as much as we can. So tomatoes are one of my favorite things to grow. Um, I always start my tomatoes from seed mm -hmm. uh, because I like to grow really different varieties than you can get in the store um, or different varieties than you can get in seedlings in nurseries at the beginning of the season. Absolutely. Um, we shared a bunch of seeds this year, so we're growing a lot of the same tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So we'll jump right into the community's questions about tomatoes. First one being from Adrian. Has anyone ever seen a porcupine tomato plant? My brother gave me one this year and it is truly amazing to see all the thorns on the leaves and the stems. I can't wait to see the tomatoes. So, she's gonna have to be very careful because a porcupine tomato is not really a standard type tomato like we have here. So, a porcupine tomato is part of the same family as a standard tomato that we're all familiar with, the Solanum family. However, the fruits of a porcupine tomato are poisonous. So you do not want to be eating those. So don't eat them. I've never seen one before. This picture yeah. is the most I've seen. It looks very similar to the lulo, lulo yeah. fruit, which is a um, also called naranjila, and it's basically a fruit common to South America. Spikes on the leaves, spikes on the stems. Those fruits of the naranjila are edible, but the fruits of um, the porcupine tomato are not. Hello, everyone. Was hoping someone could tell me why my tomatoes are turning brown at the bottom and if I can do anything to fix it. This plant is growing in a container on my porch. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely blossom, blossom and, and rot. rot. Yeah, I get it every year. Everybody gets it. It's pretty common uh, early season disease to get. Well essentially it's not really a disease. It's a problem with the plant's uptake of calcium uh, from the soil or the growing medium. So it's very common early in the season when the soil is still cool, it hasn't warmed up yet, the ecology um, in the soil is not active. So remove the rotted fruit and let your plants focus on growing new ones and I think you'll be just fine. Yep, so usually it only happens with the first couple of fruits. So with blossom end rot, what I do is I water with a bit of lime um, so many plants can't absorb the nutrients they need from the soil. So lime actually helps reduce the soil acidity. And this has always helped me with blossom end rot. So I just fill a bucket with water and um, not measuring. I just do a couple handfuls. And then what I do is I give it a really big stir. Uh, with a stir stick and I let it sit um, for a couple hours or overnight and then I add it into my uh, watering can and I water directly at the stem and uh, it can also be a bit of due to inconsistent watering yes. so if you've had a ton of rain and then it went dry the inconsistency of that can also cause bottom end rot mm -hmm. do you do you just discard the whole tomato the, the tomato fruit itself, yeah. yes. Throw it out and let the plant focus on new growth. Another thing you could do, um, maybe not applicable in a container, but if you are growing in a backyard or a raised bed, save some of your eggshells, uh, crush them up, and add them to your raised beds early on in the season. Um, they take a few weeks to a month to get absorbed and, and processed by the uh, different bugs and, and, and uh, worms in the, in, the, um, in the soil, but that gives a mm -hmm. good boost of uh, calcium to your raised beds and growing medium. So next question is from Christine. She says, cucumbers and green tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Man, I wish they would hurry up and ripen. I need some Mater Sammy stat. Whoa. So that's how I eat the majority of my tomatoes. How do you eat them? Uh, on toast. Really? I do that too. I do like a layer of mayonnaise and yes. then slice the tomatoes. and with 
smoked smoke sea, sea salt, salt. I know. which I gave you. Yeah, I also have some. I bought yes. some from Spain. Yes. So I think you and I oh, are on the same page Spain. about this. Delicious. And a little bit of pepper. Uh, so that's my favorite way of eating tomatoes yes. in the summer is on a nice piece of toast with either butter or mayo. Um, mm. Freshly sliced, like still warm from the sun. Yeah. I only eat tomatoes in the summer. Uh, I only eat, I mostly eat tomatoes only in the summer. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, I try not to buy tomatoes in the winter when uh, they're not local and they're being shipped and trucked over. You can't compare a winter tomato grown in a greenhouse with a beautiful black beauty like this that you can grow yourself at home. Or this ox heart right here. Oh, so good. Look at this. And there's nothing better than picking a tomato off the vine while it's still warm and popping it in your mouth and just enjoying. There's nothing like it. And you'll never experience that in the winter. That's for sure. Please help. We recently moved and I didn't want to leave all of my tomatoes behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I took three with me, but they are wilting. Is there a way to save them? So, yeah. I mean, it's a tough question because, you know, if you rip up a tomato plant or any plant from its home uh, and try to transplant it, obviously there's going to be some transplant shock. Um, I wouldn't say that you should discard it. Give it a shot, repot it, give it a good yep. feed and see how it performs. Yep. You never know, it might bounce back. Yeah, I would give it a lot of water um, once you put it in its new mm -hmm. spot. And hopefully when you did, uh, transplant it, you grabbed as much of the root system as you could, mm -hmm. um, and then give it a really good water. I wouldn't fertilize it right away. I would just give it a good, good soak, and then wait a little bit to give it a little bit of feed. What I would also do is mound a little bit more soil around the stem, and that encourages the stem to grow new roots, mm -hmm. and that should help it establish itself in its new home. Yeah, and so when you plant tomatoes, you plant them really, really, really deep. Yes. You can use that same theory. Um, it can apply to transplanting them. Let us know. I'm really curious. Yeah, we're curious uh, to see how to this turns out, right? Yeah, and what kinds or what variety are they? Uh, next, we have a long comment from Sissy. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, I learned about determinant and indeterminant tomato plants. I don't think I will grow indeterminate inside my small space again. I had to really do some jury rigging as these grew over five feet. And at one point I had to throw the vines over my shoulder as I went about trying to properly hoist them up. In the end, they were very healthy and tasty tomatoes, mm -hmm. though rough handling by me. So this is a great example of just lessons learned as you're gardening. Mm -hmm. Determinant and indeterminate tomatoes. Determinant, it, you can think about it as a bush, mm -hmm. and indeterminate, you can think about it as a vine. Um, that's how I visualize them. Determinant, I often think about them as caging them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to prune them as much. Um, and they all the fruits basically set, they ripen at the same time. Indeterminant, they grow up like a vine, so I kind of trellis them. Mm -hmm. And they, they set, they ripen at different times and keep growing uh, throughout the whole season. So the reason why indeterminant wouldn't work with her space is because they are growing too tall. Right. If you've got a balcony or a small patio and you obviously have some sort of roof situation above you, you need to just focus on growing determinate or bush tomatoes. And there are a lot of varieties out there. Yeah, and um, dwarf. Absolutely. Mini, mini tomatoes. Yeah. And you can get, you know, uh, beefsteak type tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, grape tomatoes. They all come in a determinate or a bush variety. So those are great if you have a small space. I grow a variety of both. So I've got some containers as well on my patio that have some determinate varieties. Uh, I like them because like you said, they tend to set the fruit all at the same time. So you yeah. get a nice glut of tomatoes that you can then process, make sauce out of, freeze, um, dehydrate. Um, and I also grow quite a few of the indeterminate varieties. And that's because you get a lot more variety with indeterminates. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. tend to give you some of the funkier ones like this, um, 
uh, atomic grape right here. This doesn't come in a bush variety. This right. comes in an, an indeterminate variety. We've got a question from Megan Bullman. My Roma tomato plants are getting so big, so big that they outgrew their cages. Any tips on what to use to stabilize the plants and for caging up the top half of the plant? This is a great question and a common issue in my garden. Um, I use whatever I can mm -hmm. to, to to stake my tomatoes and often it is not tall enough. Um, I have a lot of tomatoes that are outgrowing. Mm -hmm. So what I end up doing is I just get something taller or I lean it toward a fence mm -hmm. if it's near the fence um, and I just sort of restake. I add stakes in. That's what I do as well, uh, but I've learned that the best way to deal with these overgrown vines is to actually go to the hardware store, buy one of those 12 foot or 10 foot furring strips. They're about 99 cents each. They're a one inch uh, by two inch piece of wood from the lumber department and stake it right next to the tomato plant and you can continue to grow up that thing. So I have a so few- So how tall? Like they, 10 feet? I think they're about 10 feet tall. Yeah. So that adds um, several feet to the standard stakes that you buy uh, for tomato uh, staking, which are around six to seven feet. And some products on the market now are getting quite good where they mm -hmm. actually have uh, if, if extensions on top of the cages. So you can buy an Absolutely. extension, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, these are an investment though. Um, these, yes, uh, one, one of the, point. yeah, they're an investment. Uh, if so, it's not something you can pick up at the, uh, the dollar store, for example. Uh, so yeah. definitely worthwhile though. I have not made the plunge and, and acquired some, uh, but they, they look pretty cool and I might do it next year. And it can seem wild when you have a 10 foot tall rebar or pole and you're putting it in your car, you're walking it from your local garden center, you're like, possibly my tomatoes cannot get this tall, but yes. they can and they do. If you feed them, water them, love them, look at them tenderly, then absolutely they Talk will grow them, up. sing to them. Sing to them, yeah. They will grow up to 10 feet tall. And the indeterminate if, varieties though. At the end, right. The determinant are bush and stay shorter. Yes. Um, if at the end of the season, they're growing and growing and growing, and there's still a lot of tomatoes on the bottom, you can top your tomato yes. off. So you actually chop the whole top off. So instead of the plant sending energy to keep growing, it will help ripen those fruits. But I Absolutely. don't do that until the season's almost over. Yeah, I do that as well. Um, towards the maybe mid to end of September, I will Top, top off the plants because what's the point right the plant is shooting out new flowers there's never going to be enough time for them to turn to fruit and harvest so let the plant focus on the lower parts where the fruits are already formed and let them focus their energy there yeah give them some love that's a give great question constant i'm constantly Jerry, jury rigging my tomatoes. Don't you feel you're like a bit of a MacGyver once in a while? Yes. Like you're constantly trying to, yes. you're tying things up. It doesn't necessarily look the prettiest, but that's that's okay. Yes. As and long as you get amazing harvests. Yes, that's the thing is I really visualize my garden as this like almost utilitarian thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get any of the fancy bells and whistles all the time. You know what I used to tie my tomatoes up? Is an old t-shirt cut oh. up. So I just have one t-shirt lasts me seasons. When should you pick your tomatoes? Mm -hmm. So you wait until they are completely ripe or can they be picked looking like this and let them get ripe? So I'm looking at the picture that she submitted and I see one that is starting to blush, but I don't think I would pick it just yet. I generally pick my tomatoes before they're fully ripened on the vine and there's a reason for that. I don't want to lose my tomatoes to squirrels, raccoons, and other pests, as well as humans who may be passing by and might fancy what I've been growing. <laughs> so I tend to pick them a little bit on the uh, underripe side. Like for example, this black beauty here could probably go another couple of days on the vine, but I picked this one this morning. Uh, I let it ripen on the counter at home, face down like this. Oh, why face down? I don't know, I just, that's how the way the way I do it. Because then you can see as it gets darker on the bottom, then you know it's ready to eat. I love that. Yeah, so that's how I do it. Um, and the same applies with cherry and grape tomatoes. You can pick them when they've started to blush. 
Um, you can also keep them on the vine. It's really up to you. If you don't have a pest problem in your garden, then keep them on. But if you do, I would suggest you pick them a little early. I do both, um, but I generally lean toward having them be completely ripe. Mm. And the reason why I do that is because no other time will I get get it that ripe. So I just, and I always give a, I grow too much, so I do a little offering if the squirrels are gonna do their one bite and drop. Doesn't really bother me as much. Yeah, it bothers me a little bit. <laughs> My tomato plants are real thick with leaves. Should I cut some leaves off? Uh -huh. Great question, Dan. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. It does depend if it's determinant or indeterminate. I tend to remove more leaves from my indeterminate plants. Mm -hmm. um, so how I prune my tomatoes are, once they start growing and they're quite big, I take off the bottom sets of leaves. Yes. So wa when I'm watering, the soil doesn't splash up and create disease um, and for air circulation around the tomatoes. Absolutely. That's very important because you'll get splashback from the ground when you're watering or if it rains quite hard and you want to avoid uh, any kind of fungal or bacterial issues that could arise. So I definitely also remove the lower, um, I would say about half a foot to a foot worth of, of foliage at the bottom once the plant is really getting up there. Yep. Another thing, you know, when it comes to pruning is do you prune leaves or do you prune vines? Because the whole concept of removing suckers off a plant is, is quite common. A lot of yep. people do that in order to train the plant to have one single stem. Yep. Um, some people do that, some people don't. I'm running a sort of an experiment this year. At my allotment, I'm not doing any pruning. I'm mm. letting the plants grow as nature intended. They look massive, they're huge, but they've also got hundreds of tomatoes on them right now. Um, um, at home, where I have a limited space, uh, I do tend to prune to one or two main uh, branches or main vines. They call them leaders as well, so you'll hear that term yep. used. One, one or two leaders. So you've got two leaders on this plant right yep. here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next topic is something that we have seen a lot of on our Facebook groups. Yes. Japanese beetles. Yay. They seem to be really bad this year. Um, so Lori Patterson sent in this awesome picture and she said, she commented, when you let the kids stay up late just to hunt Japanese beetles yeah. and chuck them into a soap bucket, good old fashioned fun. You know what? I wish I had kids that I can use to <laughs> hunt Japanese beetles. So um, why hunting them actually works is because Japanese beetles are slow. So you can physically pick them up and catch them. Mm -hmm. If I pick up pests in my garden, sometimes I put them on the side like a slug uh, for the birds. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I do drop them into a soapy bucket, and it yep. isn't easy for me to do that. They are so invasive. They are so destructive. Uh, and it's it seems like every year they have a different preferred plant that they want to munch on. This year, they, they have a meeting at the beginning of absolutely. the season. Oh yeah, there's a conference. Which plants are we going to attack in this garden? This year, they've decimated my uh, peach trees. They're going after my plum tree. Uh, they're also starting to eat up my zinnias. Who knew Japanese beetles like zinnia leaves? Okay, the next question I'm going to um, paraphrase it because it's quite long, but um, she is having a really big issue with Japanese beetles and she said they have decimated her flowers, mm -hmm. her decorative plants, they're moving on to the beans and everything else now in my food garden. This is truly war. I don't want to use anything that will hurt or kill beneficial insects, mm -hmm. awesome, uh, or be toxic to the hummingbirds or wildlife. So she's furious. The Japanese beetles are absolutely destroying her garden this year. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to get rid of them? So unfortunately for the organic gardener, you really don't have much you can do other than hand picking them and putting them in a soapy container. Um, there are some solutions out there. Uh, people will say you can use neem oil or you could use insecticidal soap. And I think your mileage may vary on a lot of this stuff. Um, you can always try and see how it works out for you. But the most effective way to control them is with uh, beneficial nematodes and milky spore. But when you live in the city or in the suburban area, mm -hmm. uh, unless all your neighbors and the city parks and the boulevards and everyone applies 
uh, these products, you're going to get Japanese beetles regardless because they do travel quite a distance on a daily basis. So, um, when are they most active? So their life cycle is quite interesting because they 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 pa they live their life through the through the winter underground and then yeah. they emerge they pupate and then they emerge uh, in early summer and yeah. they get up and they reproduce and they lay more eggs and so they're pretty active from the beginning of the summer till the end of the summer so it's a long time to be dealing with them uh, but once they start the numbers start dwindling that then it'll be easier to manage your gardens. I think that for an organic gardener, the really the best thing you can do is hand pick them. And um, as Jazz said, they're, they slow. they're very slow. Um, what I like to do as well is if I, if you don't want to touch them, uh, just bring the container close to whatever leaf, Ooh. you know, they're working on. And then just, Great boop, idea. just tap the leaf and they'll fall right into the bucket. Great idea because yeah. I picked one off of a leaf the other day and I thought, because I don't, I don't ever have issues with Japanese beetles. Sorry, everybody. I've never had issues with them in my garden. I don't know why. I've had everything else. I've had aphid infestation, mm -hmm. slugs, cucumber beetles, vine borer squash. I've dealt with it, but never Japanese beetles. And I found one the other day on a different property. And I picked it up and I thought, is this going to spite me? Hmm, it might, but it might also poop on you. <laughs> and that's something you don't want. <laughs> Another uh, thing I'm going to try next year is actually growing a trap crop. Uh, I've noticed over the past five years that they really enjoy Fortex pole beans. Mm -hmm. And this was the first year I did not grow mm -hmm. Fortex pole, pole beans. And then they ended up decimating everything else. So I think next year I'll grow some Fortex pole beans and use that as a trap crop. Have them go there, do their business, eat all the leaves off the pole beans they want, and just leave my peaches alone. Yeah. What are your top three favorite tomatoes to grow and eat? Why do you have to ask me these questions? I know, isn't it it's hard? It's so hard because every year it's a different, um, it's a different thing, you know? So this year I'm super excited about the Black Beauties. I'm totally in love with this blush OG from Johnny's. And I'm in love with the um, Brad's Atomic Brad's Grape. Atomic Grape. Yeah, but last year I was in love with Cherokee, Cherokee Purple and with uh, Ox Hearts. Well, I am so thrilled that you were able yes. to join us. I'm so thrilled too. This was fun. Come back. I think I will. And keep sending us questions about your tomatoes. There are so many. Growing tomatoes is a yes. really exciting journey. And thank you so much for joining us.